Hi everybody, this is Ollie. This is another one of these kind of position statement, political update type videos where I'm trying to keep everyone as abreast with what's going on in terms of the medical workforce as we can. And that means reading and taking a look at position statements from different stakeholder groups when they come out. Unusually, perhaps, this one is going to be exclusively about anaesthetic associates, AAs. This is not the same thing as a physician associate. Uh, or indeed a surgical care practitioner. All of these groups together fall under the band of the medical associate professionals or the MAPs. Today this is a position statement purely about anaesthetic associates, AAs, who work exclusively within anaesthesia, the branch of medicine concerned with uh, perioperatively putting people to sleep, um, around their operations, but also in uh, intensive care settings and in pain control and areas like that as well. So anaesthetics or anesthesiology, if you like, more widely. But the Association of Anaesthetists, who are not a, a royal college, they're kind of a community group for anaesthesia, have put together a new statement. Let's make it like that so we can actually read it. OBS would behave itself. So basically, it's not that long. We're just going to go through the whole thing, make sure that we've read it, and I'll, I'll give you a kind of running commentary and what I think. Because I have read through this, and I think there are some interesting things to discuss about the context in which all of this takes place. It's not, if you're not super clued in, and you've not followed what's been happening in this kind of saga, it's not always clear the context of what's happening. But as someone who has been following this for a very, very long time, hopefully I'll be able to provide you with some useful thoughts. And I'd certainly invite at any time, please let me know what you think in the comments. So, position statement on anaesthesia associates from the Association of Anaesthetists as of January 2024. So I'm recording this on Tuesday the 9th of January. Over the past year, there have been many developments in how both the government and the profession view the role of anaesthesia associates. So I'm presuming this is talking about anaesthetists. The association has been centrally involved in discussions about AAs for a number of years. We have met regularly with the GMC, NHS England, so what was HEE, the body responsible for medical training and credentialing in England. Uh, that's been folded into NHS England. NHS Education for Scotland and the Royal College of Anaesthetists. And we've worked on various publications and guidelines. We've responded to consultations and have met with politicians across the UK to talk about the role, to talk about the role and how it contributes to the anaesthesia team. Okay, I mean, nothing about this first paragraph should be particularly surprising. We are conscious that AAs themselves are impacted by all of this and that we have AAs as associate members and we have been mindful of that while writing this. So that is an important thing to think about when we're thinking about the context, the provenance, and the wording and the tone of, of a letter like this. Because just as the Royal College of Anaesthetists will likely have anaesthetic associates that are uh, associates or members of the college in some other way, that perhaps work with working groups and things like that, the Association of Anaesthetists will, I'm sure, be much similar. What that means to say is that they they have people that either belong to this professional group or are very supportive of or have relationships with people who are uh, in this group. And that obviously means that you can't say anything too derisory or nasty or unsupportive or whatever. Not that that would be acceptable anyway, but it's just bearing in mind that because this statement is on behalf of the entire association... You can't forget that some of the people within that association will be AAs, those that work with them, those with support them. In particular, the NHS long-term workforce plan projected a huge expansion of AAs with no concomitant expansion in numbers of doctors in anaesthesia. To many, this looked like replacement of doctors with AAs rather than employing AAs to complement the anaesthesia team as had previously been portrayed. So yeah, this is a sticking point. I think with the associate professions in general, so not just anaesthetic associates, but physician associates and surgical care practitioners as well, the sell, in theory, at least from the government and doctors have been reassured by groups like the GMC, 
and the NHS more centrally that there is no intent to replace doctors with associate professional roles or doctors are being told that that is not the central plan. Now, whether that is entirely true or not depends how you go on to read some of what we're going to talk about. But that's something important to remember, that any expansion in the medical associate professions, in this case AAs, is not supposed to come at the expense of training the correct number of doctors to meet population need. So social media and news reports have shown as examples of medical associate professionals in the wider sense working in ways that have caused concern, specifically regarding their scope of practice, levels of autonomy, and misleading representations of equivalence of MAP roles to doctor roles. Concerns about this have been raised by the BMA Junior Doctors Committee and the Doctors Association UK, among others. The Association of Anaesthetists has strong trainee and SAS representation who have carefully examined this evolving topic. So trainees, just to, to clarify our terms there, a trainee would refer to any qualified doctor who is currently involved in training in anaesthetics to long-term become a consultant anaesthetist, as well as SAS doctors who will either be a more relatively junior but still qualified doctors working in anaesthetics with at least four years of postgraduate experience, two of which are in anaesthetics, or if they are in the senior SAS contract, at least 12 years of postgraduate experience, at least six of which must have been in anaesthetics. And those senior, what we call specialist, specialist is the correct word for people on this contract, those people will be senior autonomous decision makers, much as a consultant would be. Who have been carefully examining this evolving topic, they have each passionately advocated for their constituency's voice and in particular raised concerns regarding impact on quality of training, inequity of opportunity and financial disparity, and this has been heard by us loud and clear. And the RCOA's extraordinary general meeting was a formal expression of these concerns and others, and we have taken into account its results. Now, I can't remember whether I made a video talking about the Royal College of Anaesthetists um, extraordinary general meeting, the EGM, but that had some really significant and far-reaching votes from its members, which then shape the direction that the college will move in. Just to give an illustration of how stark that was, one of those position statements involved simply stopping any further recruitment of anaesthetic associates. A legislative order governing regulations of anaesthetic associates and physician associates was published by the Westminster and Scottish Parliaments in December, and regulation will follow one year later, so that will be December 2024, uh, this year, uh, recording in January. We set out below the association's views on some of the key areas of concern relating to AAs and some reflect previous statements and some are in response to recent things happening. So here is when we get into the, the meat of what we're talking about. So in general, anaesthesia provision in the UK should continue to be led by and delivered by doctors. AAs are valuable members of the anaesthesia team, but they are not a solution to the current workforce crisis nor to the growing waiting lists. So the whole point of the medical associate professions seems to be driven by the idea of expanding access to care. What that means is providing the maximum number of appointments, uh, essentially the maximum capacity with medical services. And this sentence is interesting because the Association of Anaesthetists doesn't really make clear what they mean in saying they are a valuable member of the team in addition to doctors, but they're not a solution to the current workforce crisis nor to waiting lists. So the, the question that naturally comes then is if they are valuable, but they're not a solution to the workforce crisis or to waiting lists, then then what is the value that they offer? And to be clear, as a non-anaesthetist and someone who's never worked with an anaesthetic associate, I'm not offering opinion on that myself, so I can't comment. But I think it then becomes incumbent on whoever makes this statement to clarify exactly what they mean, because it's not clear from the sentence. We continue to call for expansion in consultant numbers and expansion in training scheme places for doctors in anaesthesia, 
and for the development of the large number of specialty doctors and locally employed doctors, and that will include creation of SAS specialists at senior grade and consultants via the GMC's new portfolio pathway would create more independent doctors. So what this is getting at is anaesthetics as a, as a field, as a division, should continue to be led by and delivered by doctors. We want to see expansion in doctors in general, in particular senior independently acting doctors, that being uh, consultants and specialists, who we would also want to deliver a substantial chunk of anaesthesia. And this is why I, I made such a big deal of clarifying that AAs will exist as part of the Association of Anaesthetists, but I don't think... I don't think this paragraph serves AAs very well or actually the anaesthetists involved either because it acknowledges that they are valuable members of the anaesthetic team but then doesn't it doesn't really do anything to justify that I think they could have given some examples of of a use case that that they think is appropriate if they're not going to be leading anaesthesia and they're not going to be delivering anaesthesia then then what's the point um and and i think that should have been clarified essentially in this in this bit here regulation of aas is a non-negotiable requirement i think most people feel like this about all healthcare professions all healthcare professions should be subject to regulation and this provides consistent standards for training and subsequent practice maintaining standards and contributing to safety as per the draft order laid by uh laid in parliament even in both parliaments registration will be undertaken by the gmc the association of anaesthetists shares the concerns that this will further blur the distinction between doctors and anaesthetic associates yeah because obviously if you come back to this we want anesthesia provision to be led and delivered by doctors then what's so, so crucial about that is that the public, that is patients, can tell who is a doctor and who is not. And at the moment, one of the ways that patients can and do do that is by saying, you know, what's your GMC number? Because a doctor has to give it to you if you ask for them and they can use that to verify that someone is or isn't a doctor. The worry obviously is that if slash when AAs become GMC registered and the patient goes, give me your GMC number, trying to check that they're a doctor, and then they give them a GMC number, or indeed that the person says they are regulated by the General Medical Council and AAs are not considered to practice medicine, neither of which are, are physician associates at the moment, you can see how this would become confusing to a patient who... Is, is trying to use a tool that should separate those two groups. So, yeah, the GMC have now said that AAs and PAs will be given a registration number that distinguishes them from doctors, and we welcome this. This was also a really interesting development, as the GMC repeatedly told people that this wasn't possible, <laughs> um, or that it would be too complicated to achieve or something, but then when everyone kicked off, they did, you know, they found a way to do it, and I don't know the details of that process, but that's hardly helpful, I think, for people that are trying to develop a sense of trust in the GMC when they tell you in no uncertain terms that something can't be done. And then when people kick off, they do find a way to do it. So I don't know. However, we want the GMC to go further than this and put them on separate registers, whether that's online or in print form. There should be distinction between the register of doctors and other registers to provide absolute clarity for patients and others accessing the register to protect everyone from accidental or deliberate misrepresentation. There is no legitimate reason that this can't be done yeah, with, with modern systems. I would agree with that. I think that is a reasonable stance. You really need... The GMC and the Medical Act, more widely, is all set up to keep the group of people that practice medicine accountable and separate from the people that don't practice medicine and to keep the public safe. And I think this has irritated a lot of people with the GMC onboarding other groups that 
are not considered to practice medicine under the same regulator as those that are considered to practice medicine, that is a medical practitioner, i.e. a registered doctor, who has a primary medical qualification, which you do under law, the to practice medicine in the UK legally, you have to both have a primary medical qualification, that's an MBBS or its equivalent, and you have to be registered with the GMC. Those are the two requirements. There should be a national scope of practice for AAs, both on qualification and for any post-qualification extension of practice. Any future changes to scope should be developed in conjunction with the regulator and agreed at national level. So why is this important? What that means is that you have a nationally set scope of practice, i.e. AAs are allowed to do X, Y, Z within the context of anaesthesia, and they are not allowed to do X, Y, Z. To go beyond the limits of their practice, beyond the scope of practice, they must be a GMC registered doctor and have whatever training in anaesthesia. And the reason why this is so important is because this profession is so new, it's been left basically to local departments to work out what the appropriate scope of practice for anaesthetic associates should actually be. The Royal College of Anaesthetists has made some recommendations, and they can make those recommendations, but there's no teeth for trusts or organisations or departments that go beyond that defined scope. And that's not good for patient safety because it means that anything you do is essentially experimentation. Now, they may have governance in place to uh, protect patients. You know, they may have supervising agreements and things drawn up. What I don't imagine is the case is that these extended scopes are being discussed with patients and patients won't be specifically consented for this type of situation where... You know, you can imagine there's national guidelines that says one thing, but then a department has sort of drawn up their own unique supervisory agreements that take people beyond that scope, and that's not discussed properly with the patients. So what this is arguing for is a national level guideline to be set in stone that is essentially restrictive of the specific practice of an anaesthetic associate. So the GMC has said that they won't do this, uh, for various reasons, and they think this is regrettable. If the GMC can't do this, then scopes of practice should be devised according to national frameworks. It's unacceptable for an employing organisation to devise their extended scope of practice without relevant to a national framework that has the confidence of the regulator, so that would be the GMC, and standard setters, and doctors in anaesthesia should be devolved, uh, should be involved even in devising any changes to that scope of practice whether that's the base level at qualification or extended. So that's basically saying you can't have a cowboy department that perhaps struggles to recruit or maintain the correct number of anaesthetic doctors. In response to that, they start getting a bit fast and loose with supervisory agreements or they train someone in a particular block that they're doing without appropriate supervision or you've got one consultant supervising three, four theatres run by anaesthetic associates. It's trying to protect patients from, as I say, cowboy departments doing their own thing and that doctors must maintain involvement in those processes if that were to change. We do not support any extension of roles beyond the scope of practice at qualification until national guidance is issued and where organisations do plan this, it should be paused for now. Whether already working in some sort of extended role, this should be recorded on the organisation's risk register and they should ensure it has full confidence in standards of supervision, access to support, indemnity, that is going to be a really big one, and patient information and consent. From an indemnity perspective, people are indemnified for their, their typical scopes of practice. So if, if a consultant is supervising an anaesthetic trainee, for example, that relationship and that supervision is very well understood historically and indemnity organisations are used to this kind of framework where you have anything that's very new and it doesn't have you know case law or case experience underlying it and it's all very new we don't really know how different indemnifiers will respond to that and what it means in terms of the risk they will support and patient information and consent i've already discussed that's the 
that's the really big one where you've got someone who is going beyond what the national advised scope of practice is and they may not be appropriately indemnified and all of these things. You've got to tell the patients and consent them and give them the option to refuse. So an expansion of numbers A's have a role to play as part of the wider anaesthesia team, but it's important to make sure this is a complementary role. Again, I think this needs squaring with whatever it said, delivery of anaesthesia should be doctor-led. Yeah, anaesthesia should be led by and delivered by doctors. I think we really need some specifics on what that means. The association's position is that AAs are an addition to the workforce and not a replacement for doctors. Expansion in AAs should be not at the expense of expansion in numbers of doctors and anaesthesia. Introduction of AAs should not impact on capacity for training. Before a department introduces AAs or employs more, it should assess its ability to provide both training and supervision. So what they're basically saying is if you are not capable of training the anaesthetic doctors that you have already, because having AAs around can and in many cases does eat into the training opportunity that would otherwise be given to anaesthetic doctors, then you shouldn't have any AAs basically until you can sort out your training to ensure that there are adequate numbers of trained doctors in anaesthesia. Trainees should have a voice in this conversation. These potential impacts should be subject to continuous review as the situation will be dynamic. Surveys relating to training should specifically ask about this as well as possible impact on opportunities for doctors in training, specialty doctors and locally employed doctors. An increase in the number of AAs needing to be trained and supervised also has the potential to impact on service delivery. Departments may need to produce training plans to outline how all this be managed. And you must maintain a balance in numbers of doctors and AAs and that numbers of AAs are not increased to fill gaps in departments that are unable to recruit doctors. And again, the important point for this is going to come in a sec. It's important that assessment for AAs is standardised at a national level. The association believes a national body undertaking the assessment processes is the best way to ensure confidence in the competencies of the AA. It may be possible for this to be delivered locally with very stringent controls in place to make sure consistency is maintained. I will put my hands up and say I actually have no idea how assessment of AAs is done at the moment. It's not something I've looked into too closely. What I will say actually is that this is something that physician associates, PAs, have done well in that they have a national exam, the PANE, that is at least standardised across all people that will qualify and then work. And it makes it much easier to look at assessment standards, maintain different graduates etc etc if you have a national standardized exam and we're seeing this coming in for medicine uh, as well in the next couple of years in the form of the UK MLA. But this is the really I think key bit. We believe that AA should be supervised on a one-to-one -one basis. Those doctors involved in the supervision and training of AAs will need guidance in how to carry out both roles and checks will need to be in place to make sure the curriculum is delivered consistently. Guidance should take account of those who are not content to supervise AA. So I'm going to start with this bit first. The way that the anaesthetic associate model works, right, for those who don't know, and this is relevant for talking about supervision, is it takes your consultant anaesthetist, someone who's done the entire gamut of training and is very experienced, capable of managing emergencies, and the proposed way that the model essentially works is that you can run two theatres, two surgical theatres, for example, at the same time, running two different operations or, or lists, which could be nerve blocks, you know, spinal surgery, whatever. And by having the two anaesthetic associates, one in each theatre, you can have one consultant supervising both of them. So instead of having one consultant running one surgical theatre list, looking after that patient, which means you need one anaesthetist per list you run. This is saying you can have an anaesthetic associate in each theatre, say if you've got two to one, and you only need one anaesthetic consultant to run two theatres, so you've doubled your capacity or your productivity. Now the problem with this obviously is that A, you are dividing the attention of that consultant between the two theatres in this case, and if you have an emergency in one theatre or something gets very difficult, 
then the anaesthetist becomes stuck with that patient. And if there's an emergency in the other theatre, then that consultant is not going to be able to come back and look after that patient. So you'd have to get help from somewhere else. But the other thing is that it's also essentially splitting the liability, the risk management that that consultant takes on between these two associates who have significantly less training than the consultant does. And economically, I think this is one of the problems where it only begins to make sense if the cost of having your anaesthetic consultant or your senior decision maker plus the associates is cheaper or costs less than simply having two anaesthetists to run your two theatres. And for two theatres, I don't actually think it is. To have two consultant anaesthetists running two theatres, so one in each, compared to two anaesthetic associates who are at least band seven, with one consultant anaesthetist to run the two theatres, if there are any savings to be made there, they're going to be absolutely negligible, and I suspect that they're actually not when you compare, you know, salary, leave, CPD, study budgets, pensions for the more people that you add, everything will compound. I would suspect, and I need to do the math separately, that it is more expensive to run two theatres with two anaesthetic associates plus one consultant. I suspect that you would only make money or have it cost less when you have one consultant anaesthetist between say three or more theatres where three anaesthetic consultants is going to run you 300k uh, a year but one consultant anaesthetist at two but one consultant anaesthetist at 100k and then three people on band seven you're probably 200 and a bit k there as you add more theatres with just one consultant supervising them that i think is where savings would be made so the maths just doesn't add up. And if you're going to have people supervised on a one-to-one -one basis, if the position you're going to hold is that anaesthetic associates should be supervised one consultant to one associate, the question then becomes why have anaesthetic associates at all at that point? Because you could just be training a trainee uh, in that situation. And I suspect that the only answer there would be because if we have the AA there as a band seven, or even a low band A, they're never going to become an anaesthetic consultant or cost as much. And it would become just much more plainly about cost saving. And I don't know how AAs would would feel about that. If the only argument that's being made, you know, why does the profession exist? Uh, it's because you're cheaper than a doctor and we are using you to do anaesthesia in a way that is cheaper than a doctor would ever be, and that is your job. And I just I I don't know how I don't know how that would work in terms of the service and how how AAs would feel about that. And I realised I didn't address this bit, which I said I would do first, which is that they clearly want it to be opt in that anaesthetists should be opting in as willing to supervise anaesthetic associates and split their clinical liability rather than it being forced on people, which is what I suspect practically will happen, by the way. Because again, the whole model doesn't work if you don't have enough people that are willing to supervise AAs, just as it won't with PAs. And then indemnity, more information is required around indemnity cover for AAs and doctors supervising them. We remain concerned about lack of clarity. GMP demands all doctors to make sure they're adequately indemnified and we believe the same should apply to AAs. Many doctors in anaesthesia are worried about liability when working with AAs and we need clear guidance on that. When reference is made to accountability, more information is required on how this will work. And think about what we were saying about unusual or extended scopes of practice where there's no real case history on what people are doing. I don't know how any indemnifier would, you know, would begin to deal with that with a situation that they've not encountered before. I suspect it would be much more expensive, potentially payouts much higher, but I don't know. And then lastly, prescribing rights. Some AAs, for instance, those with a nursing background may already have prescribing rights from a parent profession 
We understand the Commission on Human Medicines is responsible for deciding who can prescribe and we will wait for their decision before commenting further. Yeah, I, I would have assumed, as I think is the case with PAs, that if you are already a registered non-medical prescriber, so if you're already a paramedic or a nursing prescriber before you come to a medical associate professional role, that you maintain the ability to prescribe even in your new role, that is just going to open such an unbelievable can of worms about prescribing with incompetence. So like, I'm a doctor, for example, I work in neurosurgery. Thinking about anaesthetic drugs, I have only ever prescribed local anaesthesia, that is, uh, things like sodium channel blockers, you know, lidocaine, things like that, if I'm doing an ABG or a procedure I need to suture or something. Lidocaine, lignocaine, bupivacaine, things like that general anaesthetics or paralytic agents are drugs that I would go absolutely nowhere near in my routine prescribing, even though I am legally able to prescribe them, as I can prescribe anything within the formulary, I can recognise, obviously, that the dangers of me making a mistake are so significant that me prescribing these things without significant guidance or just having someone else do it that is appropriately trained. It's just so far above my level of knowledge and competence that that is not a thing that should be happening. And that is after having finished medical school, two years of foundation, and then working as a surgical doctor. I do accept, obviously, that an AA's training is going to be more specific to anaesthesia. Something about that situation makes me very deeply uncomfortable, and I, I would not advise that. <laughs> to an anaesthetic associate that is working even already as a non-medical prescriber within that anaesthetic associate role. So that's where we're going to wrap this up. Thanks for watching, guys. Let me know what you think. I will link this down below. And I'm sorry that these things are all, always stupidly long-winded, but if we don't read them and go through them, then, then we miss stuff and we don't keep abreast of what's going on. So take care. We'll see you soon.